Uh, well, welcome, Robin. Yeah, thank you, David, for having me on. It's yeah. uh, it's 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 absolute amazing surprise for me having having known you over thirty years ago, even longer, back in the nineties and late eighties. Yeah, it's just such an incredible opportunity to to return back our our connection. Tell us where you are. Um, I'm uh, the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I've been here since 1990, originally from Townsville, North Queensland. Um, born, born and bred in Townsville. Um, I always say I, I was born in Townsville, started my first acupuncture practice in 1980. And then I learned to grow up when I went to the United States in 1987. Just before we talk about acupuncture, which we're obviously going to come back to, come back to, yeah. tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in Townsville. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I have some really good memories because I have a very, had a very strong family structure. It's not as strong now because they've all passed away and we moved out of the town, but the, the, the town, was to you know many many family members um cousins uncles you, you could walk down the street and you'd know somebody that was either rel related to you or lived beside your your cousin you know in a different area so it was quite protected from that point of view and very strong supportive asian parents that were second generation so i'm a third generation chinese australian um that you know had the normal procedure of work hard and and look after your children and and hopefully your children will will do good things for themselves. It was always that in the background of uh, inspiring to do something good for myself. I get a good education, um, and that sort of became a bit of a pressure because I'm the first son. So in the Asian family, there's a lot of pressure put on the first son. Um, Having said that, in a small town, as you became more, inverted commas, successful, and that was usually associated with material wealth, the pressure becomes more prestigious, if that makes sense. And prestige became a part of my upbringing to be greater than or, you know, to do better for than anybody else. Um, and, and, and I... I saw that as a very unhealthy place, and that's the part of my my real nature within myself that really had trouble in my growing up environment. On the on one level, I was living a life that was according to to my family, you know, doing pretty good, and you're getting good grades at school. Had a lot of friends. My father had a restaurant, so all my friends would come and eat at the restaurant, and you know, it was great. Um, but on one other hand, the, the 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 pressure to 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 it works in two ways: the pressure to do good for myself and the pressure to actually be, you know, show a, the world that I am great, became a a confusing area for me, especially when I was younger. Just, and it wasn't until I found just for, for clarity: are, are you saying yeah. that? it was prestigious to be under pressure. That was part of the prestige. It, yeah, it probably was, yeah. It, it became, I always used to term the, the t later on in life, I used to term the damned if you do and damned if you don't. And we're going off subject a little bit, but it's almost like you, I was caught in this whole dynamics of damned if you do, damned if you don't. You sort of probably answered it, but what made you decide to become uh, an acupuncturist? That's that's a really good question because <clears throat> um, I always say that fate stepped in. And people say, what are you talking about when you say fate stepped in when you wanted to choose your life career? And the reality was what I was open enough to be – try anything I uh, wasn't really clear my mother actually looked at me and I actually have this image in my mind 
of me being a little kid and she's looking at me and, oh, Robbie's going to be the act, uh, the doctor. And so very early I was thinking that I was going to be conditioned to be the doctor because I have cousins that are doctors, I had uncles that were doctors of medicine. So it was a very prestigious career. And I had the brains to go into it and everything. Um, but that year that when when I applied to be go to medical school, the quota that year, I missed out by apparently 10 people to get into that the numbers for that year. So it was a really big influx of, of, of medical uh, students. And so uh, that was the first step of fate in my mind now, looking back. Um, I went to university and I, I was told that you do a undergraduate course in science and then move over to medicine at about three or four years into the science degree. And, okay, so I went to university. I sat in, in the boarding college the first week looking out the window, and I just knew, no, I'm, uh, this is the wrong place for me. And back then I, I went to the phone box in the, in the boarding college and I rang up my mother and she said, oh, well, come home then. She was just amazing for me. She said, oh, well, come home. So immediately I packed up everything and put it in my car and I walked out of that college, not telling anybody, and drove back to my hometown. Um, I think they took care of everything in the background, but I just walked away. And so I got home and <clears throat> bummed around for a year, worked in a health food shop, which I think was a seed to, to that was being planted. And then one day my mother cut this little article out of a the newspaper and she said, why don't you try acupuncture? Because an acupuncture course was starting in Townsville. Now, I had an uncle that was a president of the Australian Acupuncture Association back then, and so I, I really had I had some sort of connection to the prestige of it. He was actually the president. And so, yeah, in 1978, I went to Acupuncture College, and it was in my hometown. So I didn't have to leave home, you know, as a 17-year-old, as a and then go out into the wide, wide world because I didn't have that level of security, inner security, to tell you the truth. I was really shy. And so I studied acupuncture, and the gentleman that we practiced at uh, as a student wanted to sell and leave Townsville, and he sold the house and everything and the clinic to, to me through the support of my father, and I practiced in Townsville for, for seven years from – from 21 years of age to 28, I was a practicing acupuncturist in um, Townsville. Um, so I went through many phases of my career. I would say the first phase of my career was all about the physical illnesses, what back pain was all about, what was sciatic pain was all about. And then the second phase of my career, I really started to see the emotions and how that was affecting the, the, the person's health and, 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 and then the third, what I call the third phase, and this happened in my late 50s, the third phase was the horizon of longevity showed up. And I started researching all the, all the different zones on the planet where people live to ripe old ages. And um, one of my goals back in 2016 when I was doing this was to – go and visit all the people that are over 100 years of age, wherever I could find them. Uh, I never did that, but, you know, it was quite an interesting goal that I had that I was. I thought I'd go and interview them and go and talk to them, you know. But there's always this element of doubt, and that, to me, was a driving force. Well, when I got sick myself, and we'll come back to when I got sick, I was forced into really, really, really getting to the depth that you can heal yourself because I now had one patient 
that was me that you know that is either life or death for me and i had a you know terminal illness um and so yeah that's a bit of it in a nutshell my driving force and what what triggered it was that that incidents when i was little one of my favorite sayings in the 80s or when my i was in my 20s was for every adversity in life, there lies within it the seed for an equivalent or greater benefit. Find the seed. And so that became one of my um, consistent um, affirmations or mantras when anything in life showed up that was an adversity. And I still do it to this day as an automatic pattern. Find the seed. And then grow the seed and the solution occurs. So <clears throat> these days I call myself a researcher. I mean, I practice acupuncture, but these days I'm just a researcher. I, I, I don't, I love the idea that it'll never end. I'll continually research something, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's traditional medicine, Western medicine, science, quantum healing, um, I'm even diving into chat GPT. I think it's pretty powerful. I mean, there's a lot of dangers with chat GPT. I do see that, but, you know, it's just a part of society. And so I love the idea of, of playing with chat GPT and, and, and helping and getting chat GPT to talk back to me and, and help write little essays and stuff. I think it's pretty, pretty good. I might yeah. be wrong, but uh, my theory is chat GPT. D, how do you say it? Chat GPT. Chat GPT, GPT. is what we used to call common sense. But uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell us yeah. a little bit about, if you would, and if you don't mind talking about your current situation, because you've been poorly or you've had some challenges health wise, uh, and mm. you've kind of headed into that head on. So I'd like to hear it from the positive point of view, because obviously. It, it is a, a shock uh, and, um, you know, mm. something that has to be faced. But what positive lessons, tell us what the situation is and what positive lessons have you been able to draw from it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a normal Saturday with my daughter. Um, it got late. I drove home. I hadn't eaten dinner, so... I turned on the light switch in the bedroom and ended up on the bed. And I was like, it was like a mini blackout. And from that moment onwards, I had vertigo, really bad vertigo. I could, I could, it, everything was just moving. And so for quite a while, two or three days, and then I said, i got to go to the doctor and find out what's going on. And so they did an ECG and they checked me out and they said, no, it's okay. You've just got vertigo. It'll, it'll pass. Six days later, this is July 2020, late July, 23rd of July, I think it was. Um, I said, no, this is not right. Something's not right. I've got, I had this in, image of me looking over the, the shoulder of a patient of mine who was a nurse. And we were looking at a medical book, a text, of, a medicine book, a, a medical text, and I just knew at that point in time that I needed to ring the ambulance. And so I, I, I ran the ambulance. They took me into uh, emergency. And they discovered a whole lot of fluid on my chest. So they drained that off in an emergency procedure early that morning um, and then proceeded to analyze the fluid that came off. And unfortunately, I was told I had stage four non-small cell lung cancer. Um, anyway, so I proceeded to contemplate it because eventually I found this little part of me that said for every adversity in life that lies within an, the seed for an equivalent or greater benefit, find the seed. And for, for quite a long time, I felt like a long time lying in the hospital bed it just kept going through my mind. And anyway, I had a shower that one, eventually they said, have a shower. And so I had the shower and I was in the shower and I heard 
really loud and clear, sooner or later we're all going to go, what do you choose? And I went, sooner or later we're all going to go. I just choose later, not sooner. And then my whole spirit lifted up. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's a choice. Uh, just explain what what you mean by having a choice and how that works. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. From a spiritual point of view, we all have free will. We're all that's 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 we're all given free will from the beginning, and so and so. Um, that free will is involved with every facet of our life, even living or dying. And to a great degree, now I do understand that. And creating disease is, is a part of that process. And and having an accident is a part of that process. Finding yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time is a part of that accident, you know, part of that process. But also the opposite is that you can be in the right place at the right time all the time is one of my other favorite affirmations. And so, um, that part of spirituality, uh, yeah, that was that happened in my American travels back in the days when I I um, had a mentor, and his name was Dr. Francisco Cole, and he founded um, the college called the American Leadership College, which then uh, had many departments, and and the Inner Peace Movement was a part of that. So that was a big part of my growing up. I was I, I was talking about before that born in Townsville first practice in Townsville, but I really grew up while I was in America. I mean, that was really that opened my mind um, to life and, and people. And, you know, it wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy time, I have to say that, but it was definitely a growth time for me, yeah. So, so therein lied the process of going through staying here longer and not leaving sooner. That so, same night, I remember lying there. Once I'd seen and made that decision, I'd seen that my life for a number of years, probably from late 50s or even mid-50s, 56, 57, right through to just before I was 63 when this all happened, I was actually at a state of um, what I call boredom. I, 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 things weren't challenging me in the same way. My daughter was young. And I was I was engrossed in the idea of being a, a father and raising her, and clinic was going pretty good back then. Um, so, But I didn't have the, the deep-seated challenge that drove me. I mean, I, I guess I was distracted too, being a father, you know, with my daughter. She was born in 2006. I think I was about 48, 49. So she was, you know, she was growing up in her late um, early teens or early tens, yeah. But deep underlying, I had this sense of boredom. Well, I, you know, I'm, is this it? Is, there's nothing really stimulating me. Um, so longevity became my subject matter of research um, and exercise became a, 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 a consistent routine because you have to exercise if you want to live longer. It's better to exercise, but not necessarily. In the zones that we talk about, they, they lived on hilly mountains and, and, and hills, and so they used to walk long distances every day, and that was their, their cardio. You know, these days in the gym is, is what we can do when we live in the city type thing, but I love going out and hiking and you know, beach walks and so forth. That that, that it's really important for just just um just the living living process. You know, um, yeah. Just because we're running a little bit short of time, just to wrap up with, okay. could you share with us two or three life lessons that you pulled from you? you you're talking about a tremendous lifespan now. Is you're roughly mm -hmm. the same age as me, so in your sort of middle sixties, I imagine. Um, yeah. Can you draw two or three really positive life lessons that you've or, or experiences from your whole life? The, yeah, the key factors that I would say that can summarize that is that we're we're born alone, and we really and we die alone, 
So really our whole life is we're alone within ourselves together. And that within that self-reflection, we have a unique life purpose and that journey can be unfolded if we just trust. So trust being the key word there and recognize what it is that actually is our innate driving force. So not to listen to outside noise, but to take that information and process it through to see where it fits within myself. And I think, and then just to trust the process. I mean, you know, I've had a clinic that actually burnt down one night on a Friday morning. I got a call from the, the team and they said the clinic's burnt down. And I was like, oh, my gosh, where am I going to practice? And I'd been there for about eight or nine years. And so you're really comfortable with that clinic. <laughs> And so I decided through the adversity to find the seed and I picked up the phone and I just rang around all the practitioners and a gentleman answered the phone that I actually was helping him four years or five years later just to find a practice. And, and he answered the phone and my phone said, oh, that's Ryan. So I, I spoke to him and his, I said, we just had a fire. I got no clinic. Um, I need to practice somewhere tomorrow. He said, sure, I've set up a practice <laughs> and it's called Acupuncture Hub. And so, therefore, I want other practitioners to work work in this place and, and take the space. And that was in 2017. I'm still there working with under under that clinic umbrella. So a clinic just showed up within a day. And, you know, all my files are all on, on my iPad, so I just grabbed my box of needles and went to, went to my new clinic, which was actually five minutes down the road from where I was already practicing. So that's, to me, trusting that the next step opens up, you know. So, I mean, I always got guided back to obviously a practice because it always showed up, you know. And then, yeah, trust is a big one, yeah. Trust, trust that if I'm open to the idea that I have a unique life purpose and that I'm willing to unfold it and live it, then it will work out. It falls into place. And be careful of what you ask for is another one because you definitely get it. And I, I still wasn't confident that you can heal your body um, 100%. Um, the human body has that capacity to come back from stage four non-small cell lung cancer. Well... Everybody's saying, no, that's not really possible and that only um, possibly maybe 10% of the people that get it, you know, make it. And so I back then I just thought, well, we'll find out if I'm in the 10%. So far, so good. I mean, you know, life goes on and, and, and other things can happen and our health is, is a big part of the process, but... The, the thing that I know now at 66 years of age, coming up to 67, the thing that I know now is that um, that unique life purpose and that, that sense of doing the greatest work, which they talk about in the, um, in the inner peace movement, they, yeah, there's some truth in the fact that if I desire to do my greatest work, then I'm in the living process. My body, my mind, my spirit, opportunities um, still prevail, yeah. And so, <clears throat> yeah, the, when, when, when I live like that, the sense of retirement, because in Australia, retirement age is 67, the sense of retirement just, just doesn't come in. I'm, I feel like I'm just getting started in this whole process called life, you know. I feel like it really is taking off in many different ways, from my inner knowledge and my inner awareness. Just because we're running out of time very quickly here, uh, yeah. tell us where people can find out more about you. Sure. Um, I put together a website. Um, 
It's called acupuncturewisdomonline.com. Um, Acupuncture Wisdom Online is one whole word, so it's a big word, um, dot .com. And all my, um, all my contact details are there, email address, phone number, clinic address, the whole lot's there. 